How many of you brought your Bibles? Lift them up high in the air, if you would, please, as high as you possibly can. I always check up in the loft, too. Come on, lift those Bibles as high up as you can. Sorry, sir, no coffee cups. you got to lift that Bible up there. Got to have your Bibles in the house of the Lord. We'll have to close down the cafe. Can you say amen? Yes. Chapter 3, the Gospel of Mark. We're going through the Gospel of Mark. As you're turning there, don't forget to wake America 365. Just got back from Wisconsin. They had a half a foot of snow. It was 30 degrees. How many of you are glad you live in Florida? It's almost 70. Tomorrow it's going to be in the 70s. And uh, I want everyone tonight to purchase one of these teaching tools that we wrote. It's called Jesus Christ is God. Every penny goes toward Awake America 365 that we can do what? That we can go forth in this nation and bring revival. I mean, it was wonderful. We went to a Spanish church. I didn't go with a team went. And uh, there was somebody interpreting. I tell you, there were healings. There were words of wisdom and words of knowledge. There were verified healings. People got saved. People got born again. I mean, it was just awesome and wonderful. Two full days. The team came back and said, we're exhausted. How many of you know when you're involved in ministry, you get a little bit tired once in a while. But how many of you are glad the Lord brings refreshing? Also, I wrote a book called Holy Spirit 4. It is a teaching book. It is not a novel. And it's 190 pages on everything you want to know about the Holy Spirit. If you'd like to purchase that, again, it goes toward Awake America 365. Here we go in chapter 3. We're starting in verse 7. That means we ended in verse 6 last week. But Jesus, what did Jesus do in verse 7? What did he do? Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. Jesus left that area because of the opposition against him, but also at the same time, guess what he needed? He needed some rest. He needed some rest. How many of you know it's good to have some rest? Even God the Father rested on the seventh day, didn't it, after he created everything and said, look, this is going to be a day of rest. The man would work six days, and that man also would rest the seventh day. How many of you know it's very important to get some rest? Can you say amen? Very important. Do you realize a lot of born-again believers feel guilty when they rest and they relax? I went through that. I remember years ago, I just kept going like an energizer rabbit. A lot of people think I still do today, but I get my rest, and I was just going and going and going. I couldn't even sit out by the pool for 10 minutes without feeling guilty. I got to be doing something. People are relying on me. Boy, the Lord just kind of just hit me over the head in a good way. How many of you know the Lord hits us with a Nerf bat? Can you say amen? He said, Bill, you, got, you aren't going to be good for anybody unless you take care of yourself, so you got to get some rest and make sure that you do. One great man told me this years ago, he said, if people don't come apart, they will come apart. Some of you didn't get that. It's a tough audience tonight, but that's okay. I can get through it. How many of you know if you don't come apart, you're going to come apart? Can you say amen? So we all got to come apart. We got to get rid of guilt and condemnation. Very, very important for you to take some time to be with Jesus and also rest. In the Gospel of Mark, you can look it up yourself. At least 11 times Jesus withdrew to be alone or be a withdrew to be alone or with his disciples. But if you'll notice here, it says that he withdrew, but a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea and Jerusalem and Odumea and beyond the Jordan and those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they heard how many things he was doing, they came to him. But even though Jesus got away, guess what happened? The crowds continued to follow him because of all the great things that Jesus Christ was doing for them. Do you notice in verse 8, it says Jerusalem, Idumea, and beyond the Jordan and those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. When they heard how many things he was doing, they came came to him. Oh, I love that word in verse 8 where it says he was doing. It's a small thing, but it means to be continually doing in the Greek. So it says when they heard how many things he was continually doing, they came to him. I got some great news for you. Jesus was continually healing. He was continually saving. He was continually delivering people from demons. He was continually seeing things happen because of the power of God the Father that was rested upon him, because of the Holy Spirit that came upon him to anoint him. The Lord was always doing great and mighty things. Just think if the church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America would be continually doing things for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Just think if this church would be continually doing things for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How many of you know every service we'd have to have a testimony time of about 15 minutes to a half hour, people coming up, I led somebody to the Lord this week. I laid on hands on somebody, they got healed this week. There was a man who was demon oppressed, we laid hands on him and demons were screaming and they were leaving and great and wonderful things were happening. A marriage got put together. I fed people that were hungry. I mean, some great things were happening in the name of the Lord. How many of you know, not only is Jesus doing things all the time, but we need to be doing things all the time in the name of the Lord. Susie and I, we took our car over to Tampa because that's where we bought it because I'm cheap and I get the best price. 
Anybody else get the best price in your car? Sometimes you got to drive a distance. So we drove a distance, and we were sitting there just waiting. It was about an hour long. They, they changed the tires. It was free because we bought the car from there and leased it from there. So we're sitting in these two chairs. All of a sudden, I see a woman. She's kind of looking around. And there's seats that are empty beside us. There's seats behind us that are empty. There's a few people around. But all of a sudden, she comes, and she sat right across from us. I couldn't believe it. I said, Lord, this, you brought this woman to be saved. You see, something is always happening. Why do you think the FedEx man comes to your door and rings the doorbell? It's not to give you a package. You got a package for him. <laughs> and how many of you know your package doesn't cost anything? Jesus paid the price on the cross that he could have everlasting life. <laughs> So whatever way you want to look at it, this poor woman or it's awesome. She sat there. I said, Susie, I'm just going to get up and walk around. So I was walking around a little bit, looking at some of the cars, and Susie was talking about her. So, of course, I sat down, and I'm a shark when I witnessed. I said, are you a Jesus person? <laughs> she was, no, I'm not really a Jesus person. A little bit of it's part of the Mormon church, whatever. And I, was, I said, you want to be a part of the Mormon church. It has nothing to do with the people. It's false doctrine. You need to get out of that, and you need to come to know Jesus. I said, are you born again? I popped the question to her. If you died today and stood before God, and he said, why should I let you into heaven? What would you tell him? She was, I don't really know. So right there at Tampa Honda, we led her to the Lord. She got saved. She got born again. <laughs> I mean, she really got born again. Her name is Cassie. Would you pray for Cassie that she's going to try to find a church? And then we kept talking, and all of a sudden she goes, I got bad heart problems and heart issues. I said, we can heal for you. She was right in the car dealership. I said, why not? I'm not going to cause a disturbance. So I sat next to her. I joined her hands. I prayed for her heart. I touched her. She goes, you know what? This is the first day I've come out without my oxygen. I just haven't felt good. I said, the Lord's going to heal you, and the Lord's going to get you out, and you're going to find a church, and the Lord's going to turn your life around. Oh, she kept saying, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now I know why I came today. I didn't come to get my tire fixed. I came, to, I came to get saved. I came to get saved. Guess what? She got saved. She goes, are you on Facebook? I said, yes, I got 4,869 friends. I said, come on, be my next friend. I want to reach 5,000. You get your own page. So yesterday, she, uh, she friend requested me, and I, I talked to her on Facebook. And I said, you're still saved? She goes, I'm saved. She goes, it was wonderful. Thank you for you, and thank you for Susie. It's just wonderful and awesome. You know what? I'm so excited all the time because not only is Jesus doing something all the time, but I'm doing something all the time. How about you doing something all the time also? Come on, witnessing to people, getting them saved, getting them healed, getting them touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. Anybody want revival in Newport? Port Richie. Come on, a church service won't do it. Jesus is going to do it through you. Oh, I got to give you another one. Our Wake America 365. You just have to put up with me. Our Wake America 365 team was in the port and the airport. We just got back from uh, Pennsylvania. There was two teams. So we were sitting there. All of a sudden, there was a Hispanic man that was over here to my right, and he was looking all over the place. And I was sitting here, and there was somebody sitting next to me, and some ladies were sitting up front, part of the team. He kept looking around. All of a sudden, he put his eyes right on my eyes. And when he did that, I just, I just went like this and waved at him. And I didn't know what was going on. So all of a sudden, there were chairs again empty. There were chairs empty all around us. He just but put his eyes right on me. He came and he sat right down next to me. I asked what his name was. I got his name and he told me what his name was. I said, you know what? The Lord brought you here to sit next to me to be saved. He says, no, I'm waiting on my sister. I said, no, you're not waiting on your sister. The reason you're here is because the Lord brought you here. I said, look at all these empty seats. Look at all these places you could have sat. You sat right next to me, and the reason you sat right next to me is because I'm a born-again believer, and I'm not letting you up out of this chair till you're a born-again believer. <laughs> Guess what he did? He got saved. <laughs> he got saved. You say, Pastor, why are you telling these stories? Not to pat me on the back. We all got to be like me. Hair and everything. We all got to be like me. Come on, get out there and witness. Come on, get out there and lay hands on the sick. Come on, get out there and give your testimony. Come on, get out there and feed the poor. Come on, get out there and pay somebody's water bill. Come on, help people. Minister to people. Love people. Get them saved. 
Pastor, nothing like that ever happens to me. That's because you're not doing anything to make it happen in the Lord. Oh, man, it's exciting to be a born-again believer. It's exciting to be a part of the body of Christ. You know why? Because I don't just do everything right within these four walls. Man, we're out and about. Wherever we are, we share. Wherever we are, we witness. Wherever we are, we can pray for the sick. You say, I'm embarrassed to do so. Why do you want to be embarrassed about somebody getting saved, somebody getting born again, somebody getting healed? And guess what? The crowds heard about all that was going on because wherever Jesus went, he was saving, he was healing, he was touching, he was mentoring, he was ministering. Oh man, we got to do it ourselves. Just think of what would happen in our community. Woo, it's awesome. Man, I feel like I just got saved. And they heard how many things he was doing. They came to him. They came to him. Turn with me, if you would, please, to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. And while you're turning to John chapter 2, why did they come to Jesus? I don't hear any answer. Why did they come to Jesus? Yeah, they wanted to be healed. They wanted to be touched. But they truly did not want to give their lives to him. Yeah, they, they truly didn't want to give their lives to him. So all those hundreds of thousands of people that came to Jesus, some of them were genuinely touched, but some of them just heard of everything that was happening, and they said, man, we just want to go to the Lord because we want to get healed, we want to get delivered, we want things to happen, but then that's all we're going to do. How many of you know they were after his hand instead of his face? Yeah. So it's very, very important that, yes, we can come to the Lord because of the things that he can do for us, but wonder if he never heals us again. Wonder if he never touches us again. Wonder if he never does something for us again. Guess what? I'm all in no matter what he does, whether he does something or not. Is anybody else all in tonight? <laughs> come on, are you going to continue to be a disciple no matter what happens in your life? <laughs> all six of you. Are you going to continue to be a disciple no matter what happens in your life? Boy, I hear the cheering until something happens in your life. Hey, you've seen Fred for four weeks, don't have the slightest idea where he is. What happened? Something's going on in his life. Even when something's going on in his life, you praise him, you honor him, you worship him, you serve him, you glorify him. John chapter 2, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. And again, that's a good thing. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus, look at this, this is a powerful verse. I love these verses. But Jesus did not commit himself to them. Isn't that interesting? Many believed when they saw the signs which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself to them. Now, I don't know about you, but I want Jesus to commit himself to me. I want to be committed to him, but I want him to commit himself to me. Why didn't he commit himself to them? Look what it says, because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in men. You say, what do you mean he knew all men? Yes, he knew that the majority were there for what they could get out of him, and they didn't care about giving a commitment to Christ. I believe it's that way to a portion in the church of the United States of America, but guess what? I don't want to pastor a church like that. I want to pastor a church that, yes, the supernatural is moving. Yes, God is healing. Yes, God is moving. Yes, God is touching. Yes, God is saving. Yes, God is delivering. But we also need a group of people that when he does or when he doesn't, we're still committed to the cause of Christ. We are still committed to having making disciples. We are still committed to serving the Lord with all of our heart. We are still committed to growing in the Lord and maturing and go after Jesus with everything that we have. Can you say amen? Let's go back to the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Mark. So he was doing all this stuff, and we're supposed to be doing all of this stuff. And if you notice here, as we go on, he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. Remember, Jesus is ministering here. Now, remember, the word multitudes to us might not mean a lot, but it's hundreds of thousands of people that are gathered around the Lord. And guess what the Lord did? He saw ahead, and he was organized, and he always had a plan. How many of you want to succeed in ministry if you ever go into ministry? Guess what you got to do? You got to look ahead. You can't be reactive. You got to be proactive. You got to look ahead. You got to have some administrative skills and some organized skills, and you got to have a plan. And so Jesus, when he saw all the crowd, he looked ahead and he says, Guys, I want you to have a boat ready for me. 
So he looked ahead and he saw ahead and he was organized. Because if you don't have a boat ready for me, guess what's going to happen? They're going to crush me to death or they're going to drown me to death because I'm right by the water and there's hundreds of thousands of people and I can't move whatsoever. How many of you are glad that the Lord always has a plan? Can you say amen? How many of you are glad that the Lord always has a plan for his people? How many of you are glad that you have to have a plan in your life that goes along with the Lord's plan for your life? Don't make up your own plan and ask God to bless it. Make sure it is the Lord's plan that he has for you and then flow and follow and find out what the plan of the Lord is for your life and follow it. How many of you know God's plan works and our plans are going to blow up? In verse 10, he healed just a couple people. He healed one person. He healed what? How many of you are glad he's in the healing business? The word healed there means to make whole. It means the Lord healed physically, emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And if you'll notice here, it says he healed many so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. They said if we could just get to Jesus. The word pressed here is a beautiful word in the Greek means, though. It means to fall upon somebody. They were actually falling on the Lord. There were so many people. But guess what the Lord did? The Lord still healed him anyway. You see, when I was talking about people having the wrong motives, how many of you are glad that even when you have the wrong motives, the Lord will heal you anyway? How many of you are glad it's not up to us, it's up to his nature, and his nature is one to heal, his nature is one to change, his nature is one to touch. And by the way, there are some families here tonight that are having really bad marriage problems, the Lord just told me. And if you're here tonight after the service, if you'll come forward, how many of you know the Lord will heal you just like he healed here? How many of you know he can heal marriages, he can heal businesses, he can heal you mentally, he can heal you physically, he can heal you emotionally? If that's you, you come to the altar tonight after the service, and God can bring healing to you. So he healed many, and as many as had afflictions. The word affliction there is speaking of a stroke or an outbreak of a disease like the flu. It speaks of being whipped. These diseases had whipped the people and beaten them down. Isn't that a cool word? Talking about oppression, talking about an affliction. This affliction had whipped the people and had beaten them down. How many of you know that we here in Florida have just gone through, and we are still going through, a great flu outbreak? People come up all the time and say, Pastor, I haven't been here in six weeks. I haven't been here in three weeks. Man, I'm still going to the doctors. I'm still coughing. I got all these sinuses and allergies, and all this stuff is happening. How many of you know that sickness is trying to whoop you? Don't let a sickness whoop you. You whoop the sickness through the power and the blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How many of you have been dealing with the flu? I mean, really bad. I mean, you've been really, 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 really sick. Would you just lift your hand up to the Lord as high as you possibly can? Father, in the name of Jesus, we just pray for those that the enemy has been whooping concerning the flu. But tonight, Lord, we just call that flu as null and void right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, you said you healed people that had afflictions, that you touched them. So, Lord, touch them right now, God. I pray that you would lift the flu. I pray that you would lift the virus. I pray that you would lift sinuses. I pray that you would lift allergies, God. I pray that you would lift pneumonia. I pray that you would lift stuffiness, Father. I pray that you would lift headaches. I pray that you would lift migraine headaches right now, Father. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would touch your people, God. Lord, this thing that has been whipping the people, an outbreak that has occurred in Florida, God, bring your healing to the people right now, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. And I believe, Lord, that we're going to have testimonies of how you're a healer, how you're a deliverer. And God, we're not going to let it whoop us. We're going to whoop it. Uh-oh, look at verse 11. Unclean spirits are around. You say, what's an unclean spirit? A demon. A demon. Anybody ever battled a demon before? Only two people? How many of you are born again through the blood of Jesus? Then guess what? You've battled a demon. You say, no, I haven't. Yes, I have. Let me give you an example. I just don't want to go to church tonight. What was that? That's a demon. He doesn't want you to come and get healed. He doesn't want you to come and get saved. He doesn't want you to come and get touched. He doesn't want you to come and receive a miracle. He wants you to sit home and watch SpongeBob SquarePants. He wants you to sit home and feel sorry for yourself. But how many of you are glad tonight that you have come, not just to be in a church service, but the same healer who was here is here. The same healer that was here, some of you don't believe it, the same healer that was here is here. And unclean spirits, look at this, whenever they saw him, they fell down. 
Why did they fall down? Not because he was God, but he was all God. They fell down because of the authority that he received from God the Father. And so it says there, the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, they fell down before him and they cried out saying, you are the son of God. And the same authority that God the Father gave to Jesus, when we are born again, we receive that delegated authority that we do not have to be afraid of the whispers of the enemy. Because I know the enemy and the enemy speaks and the enemy torments. And the enemy says things to us that are unbelievable. I'm going to share more on it this Sunday in the Garden of Gethsemane. Can you imagine what Jesus was going through and what the enemy has put in his mind during that time? And I know what the enemy puts in all of your minds. You say, how? Because he puts that same junk in my mind. We start to grow fearful, and we start to grow discouraged, and we start to isolate, and we feel like quitting. And where is God? And he's abandoned us. I want you to understand something. The enemy, the demon powers can place things in our minds. But how many of you understand? They cannot read our minds, but they can place things in our minds. And how many of you know when they place that garbage in our mind, you have all authority to take authority over that stuff in the mighty name of Jesus and cause that stuff to flee in Jesus' name. Get it out of your mind. Hello, anybody here? Get it out of your mind. Get it out of your mind. Get it out of your mind. Turn to somebody and say, get it out of your mind. Get it out of your mind. Get it out of your mind in Jesus' name. He sternly warned them. Look what he did to the demons. He sternly warned them that they should not make him known. Isn't that interesting? He did not want them to tell the people that he was the Messiah. Because during the time of Jesus, remember, the Jewish people were looking for a Messiah that was going to crush Rome. The Jewish people were looking for a Messiah that was going to overthrow the government of Rome. And so Jesus told the demons, don't tell the people who I am. You know why? Because that would have stopped his ministry. They would have probably tried to arrest him. There would have been riots. There would have been a lot of things that would happen in society. And the Roman government just would have come down and just put his foot on Jesus in that ministry. And it would have been a completely stop. So the Lord says, I don't want anybody to know the Messiah. They will just know I'm the Messiah because of what they see and because what they hear and the teaching that is there. Because my ministry has to flourish. And then when my ministry is over, then I'm going to go to be with heaven. I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die for the sins of the world. Verse 13, Jesus went up on the mountaintop. Don't you just love to be on the mountaintop? But I got some news for you. When you're on the mountaintop, you still got to come down in the valley. I love people that take a vacation. They say, we're going to North Carolina to a mountain. I said, that's fine, but you got to come back down to Florida and walk in the sand. <laughs> oh, yeah. Life isn't just a mountaintop. There's valleys we got to walk through. But how many of you know fruit only grows in the valley? That's when God does something in your life. Let's see what you're really like when you're not on the mountain. But Jesus went up on the mountain, and he called to them, him, those he himself wanted. This is the call of the 12 disciples. Jesus went up on the mountain. Now, this same story is told in the book of Luke. And it says that he went up into the mountain all by himself all night. How many of you know when there are important decisions to make in your life, you better spend a little bit of extra time in prayer? When Susie and I are getting ready to make big decisions, we don't pray like we just pray over our asparagus. Dr. Pino taught me, do not pray long because I don't like to eat cold food. And I agree with that. So if you ask me over to your house and you say, Pastor, would you pray? It's going to be this. Father, bless this food in Jesus' name. Amen. Pass the rolls. Let's let this get, get. I don't like cold potatoes. Well, come on. How many of you like cold potatoes? There's some preachers, they get a microphone. They keep praying and praying. You think he stopped. You got the fork and the potatoes. You bring them to a mouth. He says, bow your heads for some more. Gosh, come on. But how many of you know when there's a big decision, guess what you need to do? Lord, we're going to buy a house. That's a big decision. That's a lot of money. 
Lord, maybe I'm called to the mission field. Lord, maybe I'm supposed to change a job. Lord, I think I'm supposed to get married to this person right here. Those are big decisions. Guess what you got to do? You got to take extra time to pray. Now the Lord was going to gather around him his 12 disciples. So guess what he did? Luke says all night he went up into a mountain. He got with God the Father to get away from conflict. He got with God the Father that he could rest. But he also got with God the Father because he had to make a very important decision because the church was going to move forward on the shoulders of these 12 individuals. So he went up there and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And look what he did. He called those that he wanted to be a part of his disciples. And they came to him. And he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and have power and to cast out demons. Boy, we need that in the church today. He might send them out to preach. Isn't it amazing that everybody in churches always wants to preach? I want to preach. I want to preach. I want to preach. Guess what the Lord did? Yes, you are going to preach. Preach in the marketplace. Preach at Tampa Honda. Preach wherever you go. Preach in your neighborhood. These men didn't look at Jesus and say, I want to stand behind the pulpit. No, 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 no. He said, look, I'm going to send you out. I'm going to send you out with power. I'm going to send you out with anointing. And wherever you work, preach the gospel. In your neighborhood, preach the gospel. Go to apartment complexes and preach the gospel. Preach to your family. Preach to your friends. A pulpit is wherever you are. Well, you don't like it, but it's still true. Let's go down to verse 20. You say, why are you skipping? Well, it's just the names of the disciples. There's 12 of them. Then the multitude came together again. They just wouldn't leave Jesus alone. I bet you he's glad he didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> that thing would have blown up all the time. <laughs> then the multitude. How many were in the multitude? Could have been up to a couple hundred thousand people. Then the multitude, thousands and thousands of people, they came together, do you notice the word, again, so that they could not so much as even eat bread. Jesus at times didn't even have time to eat. But when his own people heard about this, who were his own people? His family. His family. His mom and his brothers. And, but when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. When we serve the Lord, when you go after the Lord, when I go after the Lord, when we're called to ministry, when we have an anointing upon us, when God has appointed us and called us to himself, guess what happens? There is great opposition even from your own family. They said, Jesus, he is crazy. This family, it was a 30-mile distance from Nazareth to the house of Peter. And they said he was insane. He had become a wandering preacher. He left a good carpenter's business. He was super busy. His work ethic was always awesome. The people following Jesus weren't really people his family thought he should be with. He was with prostitutes. He was with tax collectors. He was with alcoholics. He was with those that did drugs. He left his home. He left his family. He left his security. He had widespread opposition from Rome and the Jewish leaders of the day. And they were fearful. His family was fearful that he would be killed. So they came, and in the Greek it says they wanted to forcefully take him away. But he said, no, 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 no. I am not going to go back with my family. I got to keep my hands to the plow. I love my mom. I love my brothers. I love where I came from. But I have a mandate from God the Father himself. And my family isn't the most important thing in my life. They are important. Jesus is the most important thing in my life. The Father is the most important thing in my life. How about you? Come on, is Jesus number one? Oh, man, you think you're going through a hard time. His family thought he was insane. And now here come the religious, the scribes. They came down from Jerusalem. He has Beelzebub. They said he was demon-possessed. And by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. So his own family, and that had to hurt Jesus. He never sinned, but that had to hurt for your family to come to you saying, you're insane. You need to quit all this garbage. You just need to go back, and you just need to work in your job and come back and be a carpenter and come back home, and we'll take care of you. He said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. My father's first. My mandate is first. I must be about my father's business. Now the scribes came, and they said, you're demon-possessed. You're of the devil. And Jesus addresses that. So he called them to himself, and he said to them in parables in verse 23, how can Satan cast out Satan? That's a good question. 
If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he has an end. So Jesus was saying this, what you are saying is totally and completely impossible to happen. Satan would never cast out Satan because he would lose territory. You know what the Lord is saying? I'm not of Satan. Satan isn't in me. I have nothing to do with Satan. I am anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. I am from God the Father in heaven. I am the Son of God. Oh, I love verse 27. No one can enter a strong man's house. Who is the strong man? The strong man is Satan. No one can enter Satan's house, a strong man's house, and plunder his goods or thoroughly ransack his goods. Whoever casts out Satan must be stronger than Satan. No one can enter Satan's house and ransack his house unless first he binds the strong men and then he will plunder his house. You know what Jesus was saying? I'm not from Satan at all. I am God. I am the Son of God. And I have come to plunder the house of Satan because I am stronger than the power of the enemy. Oh, yes. There's somebody that believes me right there. There's one. There's two. There's three. Can I go through a couple more verses? All right, I'll stop at verse 30, I promise. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men. I don't know about you. I'm ready to run around the sanctuary on that phrase. How many of you are glad the Lord forgives all sins? How many of you are glad he forgives sexual sins? How many of you are glad he, he forgives anger, jealousy? How many of you are glad he forgives being a control freak? That's a pretty good response on that one. How many of you are glad he forgives jealousy? Did I say that one already? Bitterness, resentment, if you cause division, if you divorce your wife or husband but don't do it. How many of you are glad he forgives? How many of you are glad that he forgives acts of homosexuality? How many of you are forgive, glad he forgives when you drink, when you drug? How many of you are glad there isn't any sin I can mention that the Lord won't forgive? Is anybody else ready to run with me? I mean, look, gosh. All sins will be forgiven, the sons of men. And look at this, whatever blasphemies they may utter... You can say anything you want. Well, you can't say anything you want, but you can say anything you want about Jesus, and it will be forgiven. You can say anything you want about God the Father, and it will be forgiven. You can say anything you want about the Holy Spirit, and it will be forgiven. How many of you are glad the Lord forgives all sins? But, there's that little word, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. You say, Pastor, what is that referring to? The blaspheming of the Holy Spirit is denying Jesus Christ and dying in that condition. The Holy Spirit in salvation comes and convicts us and tries to get us to the point that we will know Jesus Christ and be saved and born again. How many of you can remember when the Holy Spirit convicted you and got on you and was doing everything possible to bring you to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? But guess what we all did? What did we say? No. No. Don't want anything to do with it. Don't want anything to do with it. I reject Christ. I reject Christ. If I would have died in that condition, there was no forgiveness for that sin. Everybody got it now? If I died in that condition, there would be no forgiveness, and I would have ended up not missing heaven, and I would have ended up in hell. But guess what? One day I said yes to the Holy Spirit. And one day I said, Jesus, come on into my life, and he saved me, and he changed me, and he forgave me of all of my sins, every last one of them. And I am set free from the power of sin. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I get this question all the time. 
Boy, I said something bad about the Holy Spirit. I just, I just, I just don't believe in the baptism. I believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues is on the devil. The Lord will still forgive you. The Lord will still forgive you. There isn't any sin you can mention that you've ever done that the Lord won't forgive. There's only one sin that will never be forgiven. That is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. What is that again? That means when you die in a condition of rejecting Christ, there is no forgiveness of that. You end up in hell. You end up away from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you. I want to go to heaven. <clears throat> Anybody here want to go to heaven? <clears throat> There's only one way to go. You got to know Jesus. Jesus. 